Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the first ever inaugural maiden voyage of Colin's Last Stand side quest. My name is Colin Moriarty. I hope this video finds you and yours very well. If you haven't heard, SideQuest is my new gaming show, my return to gaming coverage. Videos will post typically every Monday right here on this channel, so please subscribe and share the word for anyone that hasn't heard yet that might care. I just want to carve out my little section of the internet for gaming coverage. I don't have any wild expectations about how these videos will do. My hope for this video is that we reach 10,000 views, so we'll see how that goes. But nonetheless, it's good to be back. I appreciate your excitement and your enthusiasm for my return, and I hope to deliver the goods. If you're an original Collins Last Stand fan, by the way, that channel still exists. It will still get videos on Thursdays after Thanksgiving, beginning after Thanksgiving. So once a week over there. And I do want to point you to a contest I'm holding over there on the original CLS. There's a video there for a $5,000 giveaway I'm doing. I'm giving up to $500 each to 10 college students to help pay for a semester's worth of books. This is particularly for poli-sci and history majors. So if you are one of those majors or you know a major that needs some financial help, I want to help them. So direct them to that video, enter in the contest, and see if you win. Now, today's episode of Colin's Last Stand SideQuest is all about Battlefront 2, about microtransactions, about pay to win, and about electronic arts. A whole hodgepodge of nonsense that should be really interesting to talk about. Without further ado, I won't say any more. Let's get into the video. I hope you enjoy. The nerd crossover between Star Wars fanatics and gamers is gigantic. So this past Friday, November 17th, was a huge day for legions of people around the world. Or at least it should have been what with the much-anticipated release of Star Wars Battlefront 2 across current-gen consoles and PC. Battlefront 2 follows hot on the heels of 2015's Star Wars Battlefront, a glossy, high-production, and entirely online-centric shooter that sold millions and millions of copies, but lacked the critical acclaim and stickiness publisher Electronic Arts no doubt wanted and expected. But EA, primary developer DICE, and the devs that worked under it got another crack at it, and as is the case with most sequels, Battlefront 2 was a way for EA and its orbit of talented developers to respond to criticism, take stock of what went right and wrong the last time around, and course correct, making a better game in the process. In some ways, Electronic Arts did make a better game, including inserting a single-player campaign that the original Battlefront sorely lacked, something much celebrated following the rather vacant and featureless original. But well, EA got some things tragically wrong too. And when it comes to Battlefront 2, that's pretty much all anyone is talking about. What's gone awry? The chatter has undoubtedly injured the game to some unquantifiable degree, and no doubt slowed its momentum, especially considering a mainline Star Wars film is right around the corner. It's even hurt EA's stock price, which I'm sure wasn't welcome news to the upper rungs of EA management that, if the current fiasco is any indication, apparently have dollar signs for pupils. The general consensus is that EA failed at publishing a sequel much better than the original, at least according to critics. I've played a bit of Battlefront 2 myself, and I'm not all that impressed. But to be fair, this multiplayer-obsessed outing isn't designed with solitary gamers like me in mind, so I'm probably not the best judge here. In other words, I digress. As you likely already know, Battlefront 2's issues revolve around dreaded microtransactions. For years, a hot-button topic among games consumers, yet something that simply won't go away no matter how hard we wish it were so. But in reality, these microtransactions are a symbol for something deeper seething underneath the surface. Because the style and substance of the microtransactions that were originally supposed to be present in Battlefront 2 at launch are balance-breaking and predatory. Two things microtransactions, must they exist at all, should never, ever be. Cosmetic? Fine. Something that's already easily attainable through in-game actions? Fine. Something that blows to smithereens the entire delicate balance of the experience, though? Busting it for the majority that won't pony up extra funds? Not fine. Doing this has never been fine, actually, especially in a game with an upfront cost, making me, and many others, wonder how something like this happens with hindsight and intelligence as essential guides. How does a publisher the size of Electronic Arts, with so much experience and so much institutional knowledge, fumble so badly with a game so incredibly important, a game that could have been, and still will be, a massive cash cow for the publisher? When is enough enough, and when is something too much? When does greed override common sense? With Battlefront 2, you're looking at the when. What you're seeing playing out is perfectly understandable anger on the part of the consumer base, because EA isn't a stupid company, and we all know that. It isn't a new company, or a struggling company, or a company run by greenhorns. It's a three and a half decade old, publicly traded company that employs nearly 9,000 people across the world and grosses nearly $5 billion a year in revenue, placing it firmly in the black. No, the resentment and outright venom you're seeing all around you on YouTube, on forums, and on social media isn't always well delivered. Some people are just assholes, and this sort of situation draws them out of the woodwork. But put all of that aside, 
because huge swaths of the audience rightly see Battlefront 2 as a flagrant example of a publisher simply not caring about them, and they're responding in kind. It's a prime example of a publisher taking its players for granted, turning them into dollar-churning machines, instead of people playing a game they're supposed to be having fun with. This is what happens when a publisher thinks it can wring its consumers dry and ruin an experience in the process, all in the pursuit of cash well in excess of the $60 entry fee. It's shameless. Not only did EA hang an unnecessary anchor around the neck of its marquee fall 2017 title, but it betrayed the trust of its customers, chased pennies at the cost of the user experience, and eroded even further the already damaged relationship between itself and its players. It did all of this with a game that really means something to a whole bunch of people, with perhaps the ultimate license in all of entertainment. EA didn't seem to take into account player happiness, competitive balance, or just about anything outside of money. That stings, especially when it comes to a sequel of a game that itself sold something like 14 million copies in its first six months, a sell-through rate that pretty much any other publisher would kill for, and a virtual guarantee that its sequel will be plenty profitable without any shenanigans, so long as it's at least as good as 2015's effort. I don't begrudge a publisher seeking profit. Commerce isn't altruistic, nor should it be. I simply question the thought process behind and the intentions of decisions made surrounding a game that was already going to mint money without all of the obnoxious bells and whistles that no one except accountants and shareholders ever asked for. Why does Electronic Arts insist on playing the role of Clueless Heel when it can do so much better? Why are bean counters clearly making decisions game designers should be making? EA has responded to negative player feedback by making drastic changes, but its responses seem to indicate that it never even considered, after all that goes into making and publishing a AAA game, that pushback could occur based on its inclusion of microtransactions that are the very definition of pay to win. Pay to win is gaming's kryptonite, especially when said game already costs $60 to begin with. Battlefront 2 isn't free to play, or even priced at a budget. Developing and publishing it isn't a huge risk for EA at all. It's a Star Wars game. It's going to make tons of money, especially in this Star Wars hungry climate. But money isn't the only currency at play here. Time is, too. Before drastically lowering the in-game price of unlockable character skills and the like, which was before EA opted to temporarily get rid of microtransactions altogether until further notice, people were tabulating how long it would organically take to unlock more powerful loadouts and heroes, and the numbers were insane. Dozens of hours to unlock Darth Vader. Or you know, you can just pay a little extra money and run around the map causing all the mayhem you want. Small wonder the potential player base freaked out, to the point that a post on EA's subreddit from a community manager is the most downvoted post in Reddit history, with, as I'm writing this script, nearly 700,000 downvotes. That's quite the feat. The mere assumption that anyone would spend that much time with what's widely considered a good at best multiplayer game, when there are better games made by publishers who respect you, is audacious in and of itself. Ignorance and arrogance truly are the special spices in this bullshit gumbo. Although if I were to give a nod to one over the other in terms of its contributive power, I'd have to go with arrogance. Because in reality, it's textbook arrogance, up and down. It's a Star Wars game, and you'll buy it. It's an online shooter in an environment increasingly dependent on robust multiplayer, so you'll play it. It's $60 up front, but you will pay more if you truly want to compete. And if you don't, you can spend dozens, scores, or even hundreds of hours meticulously unlocking everything a person with some extra cash to burn can unlock in a fraction of the time heightening his experience, and breaking yours in the process. Hell, EA's actions yell loudly that your money isn't all that sacred, so why should your time be respected? It's incredible presumptuousness, but it all backfired. Now, EA finds itself staring headlong into the end of a double-barrel shotgun of value and competition. And that's where, for me, this all gets really interesting. Because EA has finally learned that it's not going to just flash Star Wars on your screen and get you to shut up and eat what they're serving you. For that alone, this is a massively important moment, where the masses spoke loudly with their voices and their wallets, and they won. Value and competition are both beautiful and essential components of a market economy, and EA is losing on both fronts. There's better value all around you in gaming. There are plenty of games that cost $60 and give you a robust, lasting online experience without a publisher holding its hand out in desperation, hoping some more coins fall into its grasp. And competition? That really strikes at the heart of all of this, doesn't it? Let's be honest. The fact that EA is behind this is a major driver of that seething anger I mentioned earlier. And while I would never condone personal attacks or vitriol directed at anyone, I know that EA elicits crazy responses in people because they never seem to really get it right or learn from their mistakes. That's why when I read that EA only eliminated microtransactions because Disney asked it to, I wasn't even remotely surprised. That 700,000 vote downvoted to Oblivion Post, that wasn't good enough for EA. 
It took Star Wars Disney overlords to get them to break down and make serious changes. Oh, and adding insult to injury, EA told its investors that a lack of microtransactions wouldn't even materially affect the game's profitability. Are you fucking kidding me? Electronic Arts has done little to earn the respect of its customers, especially in recent years. It annualizes games that don't need to be annualized and asks you to pay $60 a year for a few extra minor features and a roster update, while it drives its sports developers to turn games around in literally 9 or 10 months. It locks down licenses like the NFL, freezes other publishers out entirely, and delivers whatever it wants as a result. And when it has to compete, like it does with the NBA license, it fails dramatically. It cannibalizes its own games, like Battlefield 1 did to Titanfall 2 just a year ago, instead of cleverly and deliberately releasing its wares, showing care and fostering both communities, instead of trying to one-two punch Call of Duty and Activision for no reason at all. It cancels eagerly anticipated single-player experiences made by world-renowned developers, but invests heavily into the same old multiplayer and mobile realms that show little innovation and exist only to separate you from your money. And it beheads studios that don't deliver on whatever goals it's trying to achieve that day. Do you think if Bethesda or even Ubisoft published Battlefront 2 that people would be this mad? Don't fool yourself. This is territory only EA and perhaps Activision could ever occupy, and it's because their respective maddening behavior never truly changes. EA has a reputation because it has earned a reputation. Battlefront 2 and the maelstrom that surrounds it is beautifully emblematic of that reputation. Through this lens, what's happening with Battlefront 2 is barely a surprise. EA, its developers, and its partners have made so many good games over the years, but it can barely keep its head above water in the all-important optical game, because the good barely outweighs the bad. It's an incredible sight to behold. When I was reading around and researching in anticipation of this episode of SideQuest, I came across the strangest and most curious tweet from Jade Raymond, one that puts a nice bow on this entire ordeal. You remember Jade, right? She was executive producer of the Assassin's Creed franchise over at Ubisoft for a while, and then went to EA to found a Canadian studio under the publisher's umbrella called Motive. Motive worked on Battlefront 2 alongside EA Studios' DICE and Criterion, so Raymond was in the trenches with this game. And here's what she tweeted, with a link to the most recent Mia Culpa from DICE's general manager, Oscar Gabrielson, that announced the temporary shuttering of microtransactions. Quote, it's gonna be good. Everyone is 100% committed to it, end quote. It's gonna be good, Jade? What a strange thing to say. It's basically an admission that, now that the game is out, it's not good. But don't worry everyone, after launching a subpar game weighed down by abject nonsense, everyone's committed to making it good now. Okay then, it's too bad your money has already been spent on something not very good, no takebacks. What would AAA Star Wars games look like outside of Electronic Arts' bizarre ecosystem? Sadly, you're not going to find out anytime soon. Making games isn't easy, and it isn't cheap. I know way too many developers and I've been privy to way too many stories of the ups and downs of way too many games to give anything but the absolute benefit of the doubt to those who toil away on the games we love, often for years at a time, and often sacrificing health, family, and friends in the process. This is hard, expensive work. Battlefront 2 was made in about two years, which is a very short incubation period for a game of its size, scope, and reach for caliber, and it spanned three studios, plus plenty of contractors, has a massive marketing budget, and all the rest. I have no doubt that, on the developer level, everyone did the best they could in the short time allotted, and EA likely left no expenses unfilled in pursuit of a grandiose sequel. But they couldn't get out of their own way. The results speak for themselves. I don't blame DICE or Motive or Criterion for all of this. I blame their publisher. EA is a magnet to drama of its own creation. It would be funny if it wasn't all so sad. So that's it. For Colin's Last Stand side quest, the original episode, I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. Thumb up the video if you liked it. Thumb it down if you don't. Share it with friends and family. And really keep giving me that feedback because as was the case with CLS and with Fireside Chats, I suspect side quest is going to change dramatically based on your feedback. So I want to read it. I am reading your feedback. I need it. I want it. Please let it flow. Let it flow like... Well, I don't know. I don't know what to let it flow like. And also, please remember to support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand, which covers CLS, SideQuest, and Fireside Chats. So if you like one or more of those shows, that might be a good place for you to show your support. As I don't have an MCN, I don't have an MCN selling ads on my behalf. I have no baked-in ads, no activations, nothing of the kind. Just Patreon merch, which you can also buy at declarationclothing.com. And I'm running YouTube ads because apparently it helps me algorithmically. And God knows many of these side quest videos are going to be claimed by other publishers anyway, since I'm going to be using their footage. So we might as well just let loose. I hope you and yours have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Stay well, eat lots of food, watch football, sleep a lot, enjoy, play some games. And I will see you next time for side quest. Keep on gaming.